Um, okay, and I should say this has been work that's been done with Emanuela Gendi and Jessica Howard. Emanuela is currently a postdoc in Munich, uh, and Jessica is a, is a postdoctoral fellow at the KTP. Uh, and especially the, the, the crazy or distasteful parts of this are purely my doing. All of the awesome, careful work is, uh, is there. So, yeah. um, I feel like I should start with this just as an overall motivation, so I put and the hierarchy problem in very small font. Um, but this is some, a message that I feel is increasingly important to, to communicate and also just to motivate why I'm thinking in this direction for the talk. Um, it's sort of interesting these days, right? It's become very unfashionable to think about the hierarchy problem, right? Everyone says, well, didn't the non-discovery of supersymmetry at the LHC tell us the hierarchy problem was a mistaken fantasy? Uh, and so nobody thinks about it anymore. What everybody thinks about, it feels like in particle physics these days, is dark matter. But it's a little funny if you, if you set these two side by side. They're both amazing questions. They should be occupying all of our energies. Okay? Um, but I would say that they're both, they're both urgent questions. Okay? And so um, the amount of energy that we spend on dark matter, I think, is also important to spend, continual to spend uh, a comparable amount of energy thinking about the Higgs mass. And so the way I, I like to convey this to you is rather than talking about things like the hierarchy problem, which make people uncomfortable, they get confused about it, um, we just set these ideas together side by side. In one case, we have the, dark, the energy density in dark matter, uh, which is, in some sense, in the cosmological standard model, it's just a free parameter. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to explain the microscopic origin of that parameter. Right? It turns out when you try to do that, uh, that there are, you can introduce new phenomena, which can span 90 decades of energy, whether they be fundamental particles or bound states, that would give you an explanation for this free parameter. So that's both opportunity and challenge. Uh, but there's an extra challenge, and even if you think of the right model of dark matter, you're not guaranteed that your explanation has any measurable consequences. We don't know that whatever explains the dark matter relic abundance is through any interaction stronger than gravitational. Okay. So this is a very hard problem, but of course we know there's this parameter, we know there's dark matter, and so we should try very hard to, uh, to explain it and come up with experimental examples. But then you can go over to the, uh, the particle physics side, the particle physics standard model, and we have another free parameter, which is the mass of the Higgs. Um, and this is something else we would like to explain. So I'm not going to call it the hierarchy problem, but we simply like to predict this quantity, which of course in the standard model cannot be predicted. It's simply a parameter. Um, in contrast, in the case of dark matter, you know, once you actually commit yourself to trying to write down a theory where you can predict the Higgs mass, you find that it's very hard to explain it without new phenomena that comes at or below the weak scale. Um, and up to possible ex exceptions for anthropic physics, you know, the correct explanation, if you write down the correct prediction, the theory that gives you a correct prediction of the Higgs mass, it almost always has measurable consequences. So the reason I'm just setting these two things side by side is you know, right now, sociologically as a field, everyone is doing this. But I just want to emphasize we should also be doing that. And in particular, the problem is so challenging and so interesting, uh, explaining the Higgs mass, that we should be uh, as adventurous and audacious as possible in coming up with solutions. Okay. <clears throat> Of course, we have lots of, you know, if you decide that what you want to do is predict the Higgs math, uh, there are lots of paths that people have taken. Traditionally, we explored paths uh, that were based on symmetry extensions of a standard model that allowed us to understand why all the contributions of the Higgs math were of the size of the observed parameters. In the last decade, you know, the non-discovery of supersymmetry at the LHC has provoked, I think, a wide uh, broadening of thought about how we approach this question. And now there's entire classes, I would say, of mechanisms that you can attempt to deploy to understand the Higgs mass, whether it be symmetries that control the mass parameter, uh, whether it be some sort of anthropic mechanisms or adjustment mechanisms in the universe, or violations of effective field theory. There are lots of different, I think, interesting directions that people can explore. Um, what I want to do today is actually come back in a somewhat audacious way to the original way of thinking about predicting the Higgs mass, which is trying to do so by imposing symmetries on an extension of the standard model. Um, the thing that's audacious about what I'll tell you about today is the symmetry is one that uh, you might not have thought, uh, with good reason, you might not have thought to attempt. And the purpose of my talk today is just to tell you that if you follow uh, in this direction far enough, it turns out to be interesting enough that uh, maybe we should think about it more. Before I get to that, before I get to symmetries, I want to briefly remind you of a story that may be very familiar, I think for some of the audience it's very familiar. Um, that goes back to some of the earliest uh, days in quantum field theory uh, as there was beginning to coalesce an understanding of the relationship between spin and statistics and relativistic field theories. Of course, there's this famous paper by Pauli in 1936 uh, where in attempting to formulate consistent relativistic field theories, he made a series of observations. We now know, in fact, that these observations are go in more directions than in Pauli's original paper, but this was in some sense some of the foundational observations. 
So one of the first things he observed uh, is that if you have uh, bosons and you have tried to give them half integer spins, you find that in that case the vacuum is not the state of lowest energy. So the vacuum energy is unbounded from below. Okay. So if you try to make that violation of spin statistics, you, you discover a problem with the boundedness of vacuum energy. Uh, if you try to violate spin statistics in the other direction, if you try to take fermions to give them integer spin, uh, you find that uh, locality breaks down manifestly. So in particular observables, which at space-like separations, uh, you'd expect to be independent of each other, uh, no longer are. So there's a bio massive violation of locality. Again, as we understand, you can show in both of these cases, both violations happen. Uh, but his point, his point was, at least although these bad things happen, uh, if you still wanted to violate spin statistics in his approach to the problem, there was still a sensible notion of a, a positive definite metric on the Hilbert space, and so there's a well-defined notion of probabilities and unitary. Okay. <clears throat> Somewhat apparently unrelatedly, you know, not long after Pauli's paper, there's an interesting paper by, by Dirac. This was in Dirac's very adventurous period, um, where he simply advocated for some possibility that was outside the scope of what had so far been considered uh, speakable in quantum mechanics, which was to think about quantum mechanical theories uh, with indefinite metrics, so metrics on the space of states that are not necessarily positive definite. And he pointed out a number of examples that these were still interesting theories, they could be consistently quantized in some sense, uh, but the notion, question of probabilities became complicated. Okay? Uh, in particular, the fact that if you have a, a space of states with, uh, where the metric is not necessarily positive definite, there can be notions of negative probabilities and, and negative vector Fast forwarding a little bit, there's an interesting paper by Feynman. This was in Feynman's Impressionistic Era, right, before he had a completely sensible uh, version of what we would now call the Feynman approach to the path integral, when he was feeling his way to a different uh, approach to relativistic quantum mechanics, um, where he was studying the following problem. He was saying, let's, let's imagine in the, the sort of early Feynman path integral formulation of field theory, computing the vacuum to vacuum amplitude of positrons and electrons. Um, and he observed, so, you know, there's a, a given loop order, capital L, there's some set of diagrams, and if you compute the vacuum to vacuum amplitude, you find actually that, those, that, that, that loop order exponentiates, and so you get an answer that goes like the exponential of, of the sum of loop diagrams to the given loop order. And he found the following, he said, you know, if you compute this where you assign fermionic statistics to the electrons and the positrons, you find that this vacuum to vacuum amplitude goes like e to the minus L, in some normalization where the free theory would have a, an amplitude of one. And so that makes sense. That tells you that in some sense these uh, corrections from interactions are consistent with uh, a sensible interpretation in terms of probabilities. But then he observed that if you uh, computed the same amplitude but instead assigned bosonic statistics to electrons and positrons, you find the answer goes e to the plus l. So basically you got e to the minus l because terms of different order in l had alternating signs, and that was coming from the fermionic statistics. If you got rid of fermionic statistics, then everything just, of course, added, and then you got some uh, an amplitude that went like e to the plus l, and of course that means there's some violent violation of probabilities, probabilities quickly become larger than one. And so he observed, you know, just by looking at this, that he, to him this seemed like evidence that sensible probabilities, in other words, unitarity, uh, seemed to require spin statistics. And this is, you know, naively this is in tension with what Pauli laid out in, you know, 1936, that uh, violations of spin statistics did not cause any problems with probability, but they did cause problems in other sectors of the theory. Okay, so then Pauli, of course, had to have the last word. And uh, so Pauli comes back and says, okay, so it's a very interesting paper to read, by the way. It's a very clear paper. So everyone knows the 1936 Pauli paper, but I don't think many people know the 1950 Pauli paper. Um, it's a beautifully clear paper. He, he starts off by pointing out that, you know, Feynman doesn't really know what he's doing, but it can be made systematic. And uh, he points out that what's actually happening in Feynman's paper, uh, even though, you know, he says, like, Feynman could, could, cannot construct a sensible, quantized version of his theory, but if you do, uh, you're able to actually understand the result that, that Feynman found. Um, that if you, what you did, if you, you know, used Dirac's observation, that you could quantize your theory with an indefinite metric, um, that was secretly what Feynman was doing in his calculation. Uh, and if you do this, then what happens, you find if you attempt to violate spin statistics, by making this choice of indefinite metric, you regain uh, the vacuum state as the state of lowest energy, you regain locality, but what you find is you violate unitarity. And so this he provides a very clear interpretation of Feynman's result, and basically the point is, there's actually a trade-off you can make. If you violate spin statistics, one of sort of locality, boundedness of the vacuum, or unitarity, uh, conservation of probability, one of these things goes wrong, but you actually have some freedom to choose which one it is, okay, depending on, on how you, you believe your theory to construct it. 
And the reason I'm, I'm taking this excursion is um, where this talk will go is into trying to make sense of particular theories that have uh, violations of spin statistics in them. And so it's just useful to recall uh, this lot of your work that tells us some of the choices you can make when you violate spin statistics. Yeah. But can you give an example of an indefinite metric? Yeah, I'll give you one. Uh, Okay, so, um, so just to give you a simple example of how this trade-off works, um, just at the level of quantum mechanics, think just about a, a harmonic oscillator in one dimension. Of course, um, you could think about this as being a template of, of a quantum field theory if you wanted to use this to build up a quantum field theory where each of the modes was described by a wrong sign harmonic oscillator. What the field theory would be is a theory with a, what you would call a wrong sign ghost field, so uh, a theory where the Hamiltonian uh, has, has the wrong sign. But you can also just think of this example in quantum mechanics. Uh, so if you have the wrong sign harmonic oscillator, that just means you have the wrong sign in front of your familiar terms in the Hamiltonian. And uh, you can construct it if you like uh, in terms of the normal rays and lowering operators. And now you actually have a, a choice in some sense of how you construct the states uh, with this Hamiltonian. So one is the one that you would call the conventional choice, the one that you in textbook approaches to quantum mechanics, where you say, OK, uh, let me generate all my states starting from some ground state that is annihilated by my lowering operator. And then I can recognize that all of my energy eigenstates are constructed by acting with the raising operator. And if you construct states in this way, you find, sure enough, you have positive inner products, positive definite inner products. Right? So if you have nicely normalized states that are both the normal. Uh, but of course, the energies are negative, as you would have guessed just by looking at the Hamiltonian. Um, but you can also make another choice. You can say, let me instead choose uh, some representation of states with an indefinite inner product, again starting from some ground state, where the property of this ground state is that it's actually annihilated by what I've called the raising operator here, so the emission conjugate of this. Okay. And just to make the analogy very clear, given that this is the, now it's the raising operator that's going to annihilate your vacuum, let's just say, let's define new uh, creation annihilation operators out of the emission conjugate. Uh, so let me call a new operator B, which I, is, is the thing that annihilates the vacuum. And now the commutator of B and B dagger has a minus sign relative to the commutator of A and A dagger. And now you can recognize you can construct your states uh, in the normal way just by acting with B dagger. Uh, but what happens now if you look at what, the inner products of these states, of course, you see that you've constructed uh, uh, indefinite inner products. In other words, uh, you can have inner products where the norm of state is either positive or negative. So, so the even ones are positive, the odd ones are negative. Um, but with these states, so now you have an indefinite inner product, but they all have positive energies. Okay, so here's that's the simplest example. And so you know, if you wanted to make one way, if you wanted to make sense of a quantum field theory with wrong sign kinetic terms, um, one way you could do it, of course, is say, well, it really is a theory with negative energies, and let me try to make sense of that, the dynamics of that theory. But another thing you could do is, let me consider it actually as a theory uh, with indefinite inner product, so I possibly have a problem with unitarity, but I have positive energies. And I apologize again, some of you in the audience know a lot more about ghosts than I do, so this is a very familiar story. You certainly couldn't have a classical limit in the second case. That's right, that's right. So absolutely, the classical limit in the second case is um, obscure. Okay, so why would you, uh, so one thing I want to emphasize is, we talk a lot when we talk about ghosts, uh, we talk about, we have in mind, um, you know, the theories of wrong sign kinetic terms, for example. I just want to emphasize, coming back to the spin statistics, that the story works out in basically the same, same way. Okay. So um, if you tried to violate spin statistics, for example, by constructing a theory of a spin half boson, um, the first, what you might do is, is proceed as we normally do. So you can construct some fermionic fields out of uh, some you know, spinners and some raising and lowering operators for each of the modes, uh, and have them all obey the normal version with the conventional signs uh, of the commutation relations. And what you find is, you know, if you do this, so you attempt to construct a fermionic field, uh, or see, a spin one half boson, so a spin one half field with the wrong statistics, one of the things you see immediately is that, uh, indeed, as Pally advertised, uh, the, the vacuum energy is no longer the state of lowest energy. In this particular way of formulating the theory, what you see is there's a negative contribution of the energy coming from the number of antiparticles. Um, okay, and then there's other problems. These other things happen. Locality is manifestly lost. All these other bad things. Question? Yeah. I've never been clear to me. Do you, do you believe that this, uh, the option of having the positive energy in the non-definite metric, does that extend to interacting theories? Or well, is so, so yeah, uh, I, 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 of course, I, I know. Let's get there. Let's get there. Let's get there. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
That's never been clear. You know and I know that it's not clear how much it makes sense in interactive theories or beyond perturbation theory. Right? So I want to remind you that I'm not going to claim that anything I I'm not going to claim that anything I'm telling you in this talk is not crazy. But I'm, what I do want to do is set the stage for how one can talk about theories with ghost states. And then I want to give you an example of a theory with ghost states where the conclusions might be interesting enough to be worth understanding whether we can make sense of these new theories. Um, OK, so you, this is the manifestation of the, the uh, negative energies in violations of spin statistics. Um, and you know, without so going so Is Pauli's yeah. paper just about the free case, or does Pauli say something? The Pauli's like paper is about the free case. Pauli yeah. yeah. doesn't yeah. deal with interactions. That's right. Interactions, but, but what I really want to do yeah. is set up the sense in which um, if you tried to make sense, uh, sure, since you're asking, we'll go ahead a little bit. Um, if you wanted to make sense of theories with indefinite metric in the interaction case, then you might go down a path like the one that Lee and Wick went down. And what I want to do now is just give everyone the sense in which the path, although Lee and Wick, the path they went down, which I'll get to for everyone else in a minute, but for Marcus's benefit, uh, the path they went down was for wrong sign theories. But of course, this, you would go down the same path for wrong statistics theories. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's actually, this is a point that I don't see made in the literature, so it seems like one that's worth articulating. Um, okay, so you could instead, for wrong statistics, all I want to observe is that uh, you could take the same path as you did for the wrong sign theory, which is um, you can instead, you know, you take the shortcut instead of relabeling things, of simply imagining that the raising and lowering operators that you use to construct the theory, the lowering operator, raising and lowering operators you use to construct the antiparticles, have the wrong sign in their commutator. Right? That's like we had in this uh, wrong sign harmonic oscillator example. Um, but once you make that choice, then the result is you get a theory with an indefinite metric where all of the states have positive energy. Okay. So the takeaway I want you to have from this is uh, you know, a wrong sign theory, you might have thought, is uh, the, the fatal pathology is negative energies. By quantizing it, thinking of it as a theory with an indefinite metric, you could trade that for unitarity violation because you have uh, negative norm states. And you can make the same exchange for theories with the wrong statistics. Okay. And uh, of course, it goes without saying, this way I've set this up, the choices I've made where the particles are constructed with normal raising and lowering operators and the antiparticles with wrong sign, this is not manifestly covariant. But of course, this is just choosing to do with some frame. In general, the theory is covariant. OK, so why would you ever want to do this? <laughs> and the answer may be, you may feel now and at the end of the talk, that you never want to do this, and that's totally fine. But um, to give some historical context of why people might have wanted to think about theories with negative norm states in them, um, I, I want to remind, tell you or remind many of you uh, about this idea of Lee and Wick from the late 60s, which underwent a revival uh, in 2007, 2008. Um, I still remember as a graduate student at Slack, they sent Donald O'Connell to talk about this paper, and I don't think Donald was ready for the reaction that you'd get at the Slack Theory Seminar. Oh, um, but just to tell you what this idea was, so you know, Lee and Wick were interested, this was in the you know, early days of uh, quantum electrodynamics, not the early days, but the, the increasingly mature days of quantum electrodynamics, uh, and what they were interested in doing was constructing a theory of quantum electrodynamics that was finite, in which renormalization you know, didn't, uh, questions associated with renormalization didn't manifest in a conventional way. And you know, what they observed is, um, here I'm just going to do a scalar theory example, but they had in mind quantum electrodynamics. Uh, the generalization is straightforward. The observation is if you started with a theory that looked like an ordinary scalar, but you added some higher derivative terms with a peculiar sign, and for those of you who think about the signs of higher derivative interactions, this sign is a sign that signals trouble. Okay? Um, this theory actually is finite. So in particular, loops uh, of the scalar uh, actually give completely finite contributions to various observables and quantities. Um, but you could try to make sense, of course, every time we have an irrelevant operator, we know that secretly signaling as some um, UV physics. You could try to integrate something in that would give you this interaction. And if you integrate this, the thing in that gives you this interaction, what you find is it's a wrong sign ghost scalar. Okay, so the equivalent action for this theory is an ordinary scalar, which has an ordinary potential, but then it has some interactions that mix it with uh, a wrong sign scalar. So in this uh, Mostly minus metric convention, this is now a wrong sign kinetic term, and a correlated wrong sign mass. Um, that integrating this state out would give you the interaction for the low energy degree of freedom. Okay. So the point is basically introducing a wrong sign ghost uh, actually gives you a theory that has remarkable finiteness properties. 
And so, of course, then what Grinstein and O'Connell and Wise did in 2007 is recognize if you're interested in explaining the Higgs mass, uh, and the reason why the Higgs mass can't be explained in the standard model is its UV sensitivity. Um, you know, extending this set of phenomena to all the states in the standard model, so introducing wrong sign ghosts for every particle in the standard model, would allow you to eliminate the apparent UV sensitivity in the standard model um, and predict in some sense the Higgs mass. Okay. Um, okay, so this was, you know, in some sense, this, this became a, an unconventional attempt to solve the hierarchy problem. Um, and it's sort of clear what the problem is going to be, that if you want to make sense of this theory, especially if you want to have a wrong sign degree of freedom for every particle in the standard model, of course, if, if it, it's all negative energy, it's very hard to understand how we have a universe in the first place. And so implicitly, the choice that you're making if you try to write down this sort of theory for the standard model is uh, it should be an indefinite metric theory. And then you have to explain why unitarity, why we still have some good notion of probability in the physical states of the standard model. So, it's not, I, I don't want to try to defend the approach to, to arguing that this can be done. Uh, this was again first laid out by Lee and Wick and built by Kikoski and others and has been revisited over the decades. There is a somewhat contrived set of arguments you can attempt to make uh, that would allow you to say that even though you have a theory with uh, negative norm states in it, that you can preserve a notion of unitarity uh, by restricting your S matrix to states that have positive norm. And in the case of these Lee Wick theories, there's basically a series of choices you can make, where if the negative norm states are heavy and they decay to the light states, then there's a sense in which, up to some additional restrictions and assumptions and some peculiar uh, conventions uh, for your contour integrals, you can have a notion of positive norm states only ever scattering into positive norm states and preserve a no notion of unitarity mass matrix. This prescription, which again was first sketched by Lee and Wick and has been revisited over the decades, remains, I think, controversial. Or I guess you'd probably agree with me whether Lee and Wick makes sense. It's also just an argument in perturbation theory. And so there's an underlying question about whatever contortions you, you make to, to make your theory unitary in perturbation theory, whether it's not perturbably well defined is completely open question. There's actually one other thing. Even if you wanted to believe that there's a sensible prescription for this theory that's have a unitary S matrix for physical states, there's a, another underlying question about whether it actually makes sense to solve the hierarchy problem, which is the following. Okay. When we say that, uh, for example, this theory with an ordinary scalar and a wrong sign ghost scalar, there's no UV sensitivity in the sense that loops that would correct the mass, for example, of the coupling of the ordinary scalar, they don't depend on some uh, cutoff scale. Um, in order for that cutoff scale dependence to vanish, the same cutoff has to be uh, the cutoff of both the ordinary scalar and the wrong side scalar. Okay. And if they both have the same cutoff, so their loops are cut off at the same scale, then the cutoff dependence vanishes. But it's actually not at all obvious why that should be the case in this theory. Right? So in any theory that has different degrees of freedom, they can all have different effective cutoffs. The cutoff is just a stand-in for UV degrees of freedom. And when you say that this is your theory, it's not obvious that these things have the same cutoff. In space-time supersymmetry, when we do this argument as a shorthand for why supersymmetry solves the hierarchy problem, the cutoffs also cancel, but that's because there's a symmetry that tells you that these states have the same cutoff. If you simply say that for every particle in the standard model, I have a weak partner, nothing guarantees that they have the same cutoff. So there's also even a deeper sense, apart from the unitarity questions, where it's not at all obvious that this approach to predicting the Higgs mass makes sense. Okay, so that was some motivation now for the unconventional path I want to take you down for the rest of the talk. Uh, so it sounds like the path I'm going to take you down is very conventional. Um, but I don't mean that we're going to talk about supersymmetry in the familiar sense of a non-compact space-time symmetry. That's the sort of supersymmetry we've looked for at the OFC. Uh, what I want to instead do is, is tell you about what happens if you try to write down supersymmetry as a compact internal symmetry, like an ordinary global symmetry or a new symmetry. So if you're wondering why you can even attempt this and why if you can attempt this, why you've never heard of it, um, it's because there's a proliferation of ghosts. Okay? In fact, there's not just the, the wrong sign ghosts that you get in the Wick theory. There's also the spin statistics ghosts. So there's the states uh, that have the same issues coming from violations of spin statistics. All right, so there's both, both types of ghosts that you have to contend with. Um, but what I want to tell you is if you at least push ahead and ask, okay, what, what are the properties of a theory with internal supersymmetry? It has these ghosts. 
Uh, plausibly, you can make peace with these ghosts in the same way that Lee and Wick tried to make peace with their wrong sign ghosts. And the point I want to make to you today is that if you at least try to push down in this direction, um, some very surprising things happen. And the surprising things are interesting enough that I think we should continue to think about them. So what does it mean to have an internal supersymmetry instead of a space-time supersymmetry? So when we do space-time supersymmetry, of course, we have in mind an extension of the Poincaré, uh, where the supersymmetry generators now have some non-trivial relations with the normal generators of Poincaré. Here, what I have in mind instead is just an internal symmetry, okay? Uh, that instead of being based on an ordinary Lie algebra, it is based on a graded Lie algebra. Uh, so the notation we would use for that is SUN uh, bar M, where N and M are labeling, in some sense, the set of the number of uh, commuting and anti-commuting components of the algebra. And what this algebra looks like, in some sense you could think of it for SUN bar M, uh, consists you know, of matrices that have a form where they have some N by N and M by M blocks, which are you know, ordinary complex Hermitian matrices, like you're used to from ordinary bosonic symmetries. And then these off-diagonal blocks instead have complex Grassmann components, so anti-commuting components. And the algebra, uh, it's formed by the satisfaction of commutation relations satisfied by the bosonic pieces, and anti-commutation relations satisfied by the Grassmann pieces, and then commutation relations that relate the two. So that's the notion of a graded Lie algebra. Um, once you introduce this notion of grading, there are some steps you have to take beyond your conventional approach to Lie algebras. Uh, instead of, for example, constructing objects that are traceless, you instead construct things that are super traceless, uh, where the trace now has some relative uh, weighting to it that tells you that when you take the trace, some pieces get a positive weight and some pieces get a negative weight. This is, of course, should be signaling. You should have a sense in which you can anticipate that we're running kind of negative norm states when we try to construct quantum field theories with these symmetries. Um, if you wanted to take the normal path to constructing a group uh, that has the same structure or local structure as the algebra, um, what you should imagine doing is you have some collection of generators. So you have some generators that you should think of as generating some SUN piece here, and some generators that generate an SUM piece down here. Uh, you have an extra U1 generator, in fact, that, that corresponds to the fact that there's always going to be something living on the diagonal, and then you have the fermionic generators that correspond to uh, the components that satisfy the anti-commutation relation. And you can do all of the normal things once you introduce these generators, so you can exponentiate them to form group elements, uh, and that's how you can define not just a, a super Lie algebra, but a super group. Okay. One thing I want to emphasize, hopefully as it's clear already from the generators, you know, this super group has a bosonic you know, subgroup to it, which is just SUN across SUM with the U1, and then it has these fermionic. But the fermions, again, they're not spinners, they're not space-time spinners, they're just Grassmann value parameters. Okay. Yeah? So, uh, we have traceless, it's not traceless, but it's super traceless. traceless. So are you saying a, it's not determinant one, but there's a notion of super determinant of sequence? Exactly, exactly. I'm, I'm actually not, yeah, you, you, much of what I'll tell you, you could formulate the notion of a super determinant, that's actually not, it turns out for, for, uh, sorry, but, but yes, yes, there's a well-defined notion of super determinant. It's not going to play a role in what I tell you, but you could formulate the story in a way in which the determinants and super determinants are important. Okay. Um, of course, uh, you know, the, so, so there's a, um, a metric in, in, in the supergroup that's constructed by taking the super trace of pairs of generators. Uh, so that gives you the normal notion of the metric in the supergroup. And what happens when you compute this, if you look at the components, is you see that there's an upper block uh, where you have what looks like a very sensible uh, metric for the SUN bosonic part of your symmetry algebra. Uh, the sign for the U1 piece depends on M and N, but then regardless, the sign for the SUN block has the wrong sign. Okay, so again, I put a little danger sign here because this is going to indicate that, of course, any representations you construct in the adjoint are going to necessarily have wrong sign ghosts. In them. And then, of course, you have the fermionic direction. And um, there's a completeness relation. If I take two generators and I contract them together with this metric, there's a completeness relation that depends on, on the grading, which is you know, whether you're talking about fermionic or bosonic parts. Okay, so what I want to do now is say, all right, we have a notion of a graded Lie algebra. What happens if we try to make this an internal symmetry of a quantum field theory in four dimensions? 
uh, what we know something is going to go wrong, right? There's very powerful theorems that tell us that anytime we try to have internal symmetry groups that are not just uh, Lie groups, that, that there's going to be some negative number of states. So let's just let's just see what happens if we try to write down a field theory uh, where the internal symmetry is is this greater than the algebra. Okay. So the simplest example you could think of is just start with an internal symmetry that's S U N bar M. Sorry, can I, sorry yeah. can I, it's not actually. Uh, 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 so if I just ask sort of the the, the abstract uh, question of I want to represent, I want to have. Uh, for example, let's say unitary action of this group on some Hilbert space. Okay, that's my that's what I want, and I'm willing to allow the Hilbert space. I allow the Hilbert space to have uh, have an indefinite metric. Okay, then are you telling me that there? So, what, I just want to kind of see what is the theorem you're claiming? Are you claiming that, for example, all such representations have uh, negative norm states. They I, all, all of, of them, or all, all of the uh, sorry, just the ones you know how to construct. The ones, the ones that I constructed, all of the ones I know how to construct, they either have wrong statistic states, or they have both wrong statistics and wrong side states. Okay. So the simplest example, let's start with a scalar in the fundamental of S U N bar M. Okay. So what that means, you can, in some basis, uh, that consists of uh, an n plus m component vector of scalars, where the upper n components, uh, n plus m vector of complex scalars, the upper n components are just ordinary complex scalars, and the bottom m components are complex scalars <coughs> with fermionic statistics. Okay. So these are scalars with fermionic statistics, and they violate string statistics. So this is an obvious place where now something is gonna go, has gone wrong. Uh, we, we see, in fact, that because of this grading, we have uh, boson uh, uh, scalars with fermionic statistics. Okay. So we know immediately all the issues with unitarity are present in this theory, uh, but what I want to now ask is what, what are the properties of this theory? We just go ahead and try to compute in By the way, I just realized this is just a comment. I don't know if this is yeah. useful at all, but, but um, my question was kind of inspired by this, remembering this example. So I'd asked earlier, are there, do we know examples of uh, where we can quantize theories with uh, negative norm yep. uh, Hilbert spaces if they're interacting. There's one example Two we know of. No, no, no. Four-dimensional, not abelian gauge theory. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So if you if you look at the the ghost sector of that, that has an indefinite metric space. You're using a different. You actually you actually have a choice in that case. You could have tried to define it with a positive uh, metric space. Then. Other things yes. would go wrong. It wouldn't be the ghost that you want it to be, but there there is an option there, and it's an interacting. Theory. That's right. The, the reason, I mean, and, and if you're willing to take that as a positive example of an interacting theory with an indefinite metric quantization, then I'm I'm happy to, yeah. to also. It has take lots it. of other problems we, we know, if you don't yeah, do the yeah. projection. But. We we know in that case. I, I said say because we know in that case there are other ways of formulating the theory, picking definite gauges, for example. Uh, no, but I'm saying you could just say I'm not going to do the projection. I'm going to try to make sense out of the full yep. Hilbert space. Including the the negative norm states, but then you also know there's a BRST symmetry, so you have a, you have a powerful symmetry that tells you yeah, that positive norm states. I want to do something yeah. different. I don't want to just talk about gauge theory. I want to say yeah. that's an interacting theory with yes. a negative. Yes, norm. that that is an interacting negative theory with an indefinite states. absolutely with the negative norm states. You can think of really if, if you open an axiomatic QFT book, the Russians will tell you that that you should quantize that theory as an indefinite. But I guess the reason I don't want to take it as too encouraging an example is that we know in that case there's a powerful symmetry that tells you why unitarity is safe. Right? And, and I don't know in this situation that I have that powerful symmetry. So I don't want to be that optimistic. I should say there's also, you know, there are these two-dimensional conformal field theories, this, uh, was it the, um, the yang the edge singularity, right? So there are lower-dimensional theories where uh, there are negative normal states in interacting theories that also seem to make sense. but whether those exist in higher dimensions is not obvious. Okay. Um, so why, why continue to think about this theory? Well, this is the part where it's worth continuing to think about the theory. So you can just write down you know, a Lagrangian for this theory consistent with uh, this uh, internal symmetry. You can compute all the Feynman rules. Uh, and then you can go ahead and say, OK, um, let me look at the renormalization of the ordinary scalar that lives in this multiplet. So let me look at the corrections to its mass. So there's two diagrams in this theory. One, there's just a loop of the ordinary scalars, and the other, there's just a loop of the wrong side scalars. 
Um, and what you see is, you know, there's various symmetry factors and multiplicity factors. You get a coefficient out front. They both depend on the same quartic because of the underlying symmetry. You get a factor out in front that the, the counting factor for the bosonic, ordinary bosonic loops goes like n plus 1. And the counting factor for these wrong sign loops goes like m with a different sign coming from the fact that one of these loops has uh, fermionic statistics and the other bosonic statistics. Okay. But of course, so the fact that they... Lost track. This is a theory of a bosonic scaling. scalar plus a fermionic scalar. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So it's what I would call a scaling multiple of an SCM. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and the fact that they enter with opposite signs now tells you if you add them up, this is going to cancel partially the contributions here. So what's happening with these wrong statistic states is exactly like Fede and Popov ghosts in the gauge theory. They're canceling uh, other polarizations. Of course, in this case, you know, these are all physical, uh, so it's a peculiar cancellation. Is there a simple reason why it's n plus 1 instead of n? Um, good. So you, there's a couple of things, I should say. In general, I'm always going to consider uh, sun bar m, where n is not equal to m. That's because sun n is special. Um, so there's no one factor, and actually there is no fundamental representation for sun n. So while you can use sun n, to make a finite version of Yang Mills, you can't have a finite version of Yang Mills with matter in the fundamental representation. So automatically, so the reason I should say by them, so our starting point, in fact, for exploring all of these theories was this set of papers that were trying to regularize Yang Mills for the exact normalization group, where they use SUNN as a regularization. Uh, but you can't do, write down a quasi-realistic theory because the representations aren't right. You can't write down things in the fundamental. So we just asked ourselves the question, is there a value of M that is not equal to n, for which there are interesting finite properties and there's a fundamental representation. Wait, um, you, you answered an intelligent question. I just had a stupid question. Why, <laughs> why, also, why is it n plus well, 1? Well, this question doesn't make sense. Oh, why, so why is it n plus 1? So here, remember, there's two, there's, two, there's two things that can happen. You can either have a trace where you're counting n in this loop, right? So you know, in this quartic, I can either yeah, have. It's just two arrangements of the quartic. Right. Exactly. So the two, so that's one of them is where you're tracing over the n, and the other one is the one. So that's why that's n plus one. Whereas here, there's no choice. You can only trace over these. Okay. Um, okay. But you'll notice, right, if you take m to be n plus one, then the UV sensitivity cancels. Okay. In fact, these cancel entirely against each other. So you get a finite theory. Um, of course, if you study supersymmetry. Uh, the next question you ask is, what if I break the symmetry by a dimensionable parameter? In particular, what if I write down a mass term for the fermionic scalars, okay? um, so that they acquire a mass that's different from the bosonic scalars? And what you find is um, the quadratic divergence will still cancel. Uh, you get a correction to the mass of the ordinary scalar that is proportional to loop factor, whatever the soft-breaking mass term was, and some logarithmic dependence on the cutoff. So it's exactly like uh, soft breaking in ordinary supersymmetry. So you can imagine a theory in which you make the wrong statistics field heavier uh, by breaking the symmetry with dimensional parameters. So this is amusing enough to hold our noses at the violations of spin statistics. Thank you, John. So the next thing, of course, you'd ask is, can I can I make the symmetry a local symmetry? Okay. Can I can I add gauge bosons to the theory? Um, I should say, if you want to, where this is systematically done for the first time, this is 2001 paper that uses uh, graded D algebra for the regularization of Yang Mills. Basically, what they wanted to do was figure out how do you do palieval R's for Yang Mills? Because if you do try to do palieval R's by hand for Yang Mills, you quickly run into trouble. So they asked, what's a way to organize palieval R's in a way that works? Uh, and they came up with this very interesting description. Um, and so, you know, this particular the local symmetry story really originates here. So, all right, let's imagine we turned on some gauge bosons. Can I just ask, yeah. you know, on the previous thing, if you yeah. just, if you just uh, renamed your phi tildes or whatever they are as poly BRs field and gave them a different mass, would this be a poly BRs regulator? Um, it, 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 so normally when we say poly volars, the wrong statistics shows up for poly volars. We do poly volars for scalars, we're content to normally just do wrong sign fields. Right. We, so don't. we can do that, but there's no symmetry there. You That's just right. keep I'm mean, asking is you're just when you say super finite, do you just mean one loop or do you mean they're all loops? I, I I so we have not checked at all loops, but I think the I have reason I my belief is that this is true. So. Yeah, so I'm just asking, at least of the order that you check, if you just by hand gave the red guys 
yeah. a big mass, yeah. but it behave, it yes. behave like polygons. Yes, exactly. So this is so you could think of it as a version of polygons. Exactly. And in the same way that Lee, and so Lee Wick started off its life as saying, normally for scalars, we do polyvalars with long sign fields. Let's promote them to physical degrees of freedom. This amounts to saying, so of course for fermions, if you wanted to do polyvalars, the sensible way to do polyvalars for fermions, although we never do it, because by the time we do fermions, we've already skipped the dim rag. But if you wanted to, you would introduce wrong statistics fermions. And so that's that's a specific place where there are polyvalars fields that are wrong statistics fermions that are precisely this. These are just the wrong statistics of those ones. But do we know how polyvalar if you want to make it finite when you still have log divergence? So the, just for the, okay, so it may be that there are log divergences of higher loop order, but it's purely the one loop correction, the scalar theory, this is, this is it, right, for the mass. Okay. There may also be wave function normalization, right? So I'm not claiming that I've gotten rid of wave function normalization. Okay, this is just the, the mass correction. Um, okay, so if you want to do gauge bosons, of course now you couple gauge theories to uh, the upper and lower bosonic blocks. You already know the lower bosonic block is going to be troubled because of the sign of the metric in the group. Uh, and then you also couple, these are now fermionic vector bosons, right? They couple in the off diagonal blocks, and then you have the U1. Okay. So this is a theory, this now has both. So again, Marcus, to your question, if you write down fields in the adjoint, uh, you have both wrong statistics fields on the off diagonal and wrong sign fields on the diagonal. And the wrong sign fields are, of course, because the, there's in some sense of non compact symmetry. So, um, yeah, the fact that these are wrong signs just comes from the sign in the, the metric for the gauge group. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, so now I know how to do one thing, which is compute uh, corrections to the mass of my ordinary scalar. So if I have this scalar multiplet charged under SUN bar M, now I can ask what are the effects of loops of gauge bosons. Uh, and at this point, we're powerful enough that you can just do the whole calculation at the level of the supergroup. And what you find is all the contributions to the mass of the scalar multiplet, they actually are proportional out in front uh, to an instance of the completeness relation, where you're contracting two generators from complete interactions through the group metric. And once you simplify everything, you find that this is proportional to the sum of two terms, which you'll notice vanishes when m is equal to n plus 1. So again, for m is equal to n plus 1, the contributions from gauge bosons uh, also vanish. At this point, you might ask yourself another question. If you have thought about space-time supersymmetry, is can, can you do soft breaking for these fields? Um, now, there's one reason why you would already use some sort of soft breaking shouldn't work, right? Because, of course, um, the gauge bosons that live in the bosonic part of the symmetry, here and here, these are ordinary non-abelian gauge bosons. Now, these ones have a wrong sign overall, but otherwise they're non-abelian gauge bosons. We know if you give them mass, right, there will be violation of unitarity. Okay. So it's, it should be clear that you can't give mass, soft masses to the ordinary bosonic vector bosons without having a unitarity problem. But something that appears to be very surprising is you can make special choices of soft masses for the fermionic vectors that allow you to lift them without having a unitarity violation. Okay. So we've only checked scattering of longitudinal vectors uh, at tree level, but uh, there's an assignment of soft masses for the off-diagonal fields in line length and heavy. Um, and so in some sense, it's like giving masses to gay genos in space-time supersymmetry. All right, so we keep going. The last thing for us to say is we should have fermions and Yukawa couplings. Um, the example I'm going to give you, because having interactions with two fermions in the fundamental, it's slightly an intricate argument for the symmetry structure. I'll just give you the simplest example you could write down, uh, which is one where you have one fermion in the fundamental, one in the adjoint, uh, and you're coupling to the scalar in the fundamental. And so again, here now, if you have uh, fermionic multiplets, these are Lorentz spinners that have bosonic statistics. So these are what you would have called polyvalized fermions. Okay. Uh, and okay, you know what the answer is going to be. You do the calculation of loop corrections. It's proportional to a factor of the completeness relation. And so again, for n is equal to n plus 1, the mass correction finish. OK, so this is interesting. Now, it's, it's like, to me, that is interesting enough to be worth studying this theory more, right? As far as I know, and this is an observation that no one has made before, that uh, there are supergroups where, for appropriate choices of the number of fermionic and anti-fermionic generators, mass corrections to ordinary scalars at least vanish in one loop, and the symmetry can be softly broken uh, exactly as in space-time supersymmetry. 
So that's interesting enough to, to be worth pushing on a little bit. Um, you probably have a lot, of, if you want to push on it more, there are lots of other questions you can ask. One question you can ask is, can you spontaneously break these groups? Right? How does spontaneous symmetry break them? Yeah, sorry, I, so the, the n, n plus one, I'm, I'm just not sure how that, that works. Is, it the, is the idea that the, you're getting fundamental fermions from the off-diagonal n plus n plus one, or what? Sorry, I just... Um, oh, the counting here, yeah, in this example, it's a little intricate because uh, the fermions in the adjoint. You can also write down an example where there's a fermion in the fundamental, uh, and the finite also, finite also works for... Uh, it, this sort of seems like it has, I'm not really following the details, but it, it seems like it has a little bit of flavor of like, when you're doing this thing and you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, unify like the, the gauge Higgs unification where you're putting these things into these higher multiplets, yeah. but you've got to ensure that when you decompose yeah. them, you get out the things that you want, yeah. and that's a little tricky. Yeah. You have yeah. to, it's, it's like that, it's a bit like that. Yeah, right? and especially for the Yukawa interactions where, you know, again, the, it's, you, you have to stand on your head somewhat to do it correctly if you want to have a singlet. And you uh, generally are getting more stuff than what you want. You always right? get more stuff than yeah, what you want. Right. But the good news is, for the most part, you can always add soft masses uh, without right. and, and just have okay. that be the usual consequence. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, so you might ask what happens if I, if I break these theories spontaneously. Um, you know, is there a super Goldstein theorem? I actually have some questions about that, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so the thing, the thing, the simplest thing you might try to do is say, let's ask, can I, if I have an SUN bar n plus one theory, which has these nice symmetry properties, can I add some scalar multiplet in some representation uh, that gets a vacuum expectation value? For example, Higgs is this down to its bosonic subgroup. Okay. Then you would end up with a theory where the infrared degrees of freedom, you know, the infrared symmetry is just the bosonic part of the symmetry. Um, in the interest of time, I don't want to get in the weeds with this. The simplest thing you would do, which is add something to the adjoint, uh, it turns out that if you actually study this potential, it always has a runaway direction. Um, so, and runaways, of course, are a little peculiar when you have theories with wrong same kinetic terms, but the correct analysis of the quadratic fluctuations is that that simplest example doesn't have any local minima that break the group. Um, but you can introduce a slightly more complicated example, which again was inspired by this attempt to regularize young mills, where your scalar transforms this is sort of a direct product of a fundamental and anti-fundamental representation. And then you can write down a generic potential for it, in which it acquires a vacuum expectation value, and all the quadratic fluctuations are stabilized, and it has all the properties that you want. So there is some local minimum. The configuration of the VEV around this local minimum is uh, the, in the appropriate normalization, there's some positive VEV for the upper N block and some negative VEV for the lower N block of the bosons. And so that has the effect of Higgsing the theory down to its bosonic subgroup. <clears throat> you can show that, you know, with this relatively generic potential, that there's no runaway at tree level, and if you're heroic like Emanuele is, and you can do a full one loop Coleman Weinberg calculation with arbitrary metric, you can in fact show that this is true even one loop. Um, there's something I'm not sure I completely understand, which is that Goldstone's theorem appears to work exactly like you'd expect, right? So in Goldstone's theorem, we expect to have some massless degree of freedom for every broken generator. In this case, what the VEV is doing is it's breaking all of the uh, anti-commuting generators, and so you'd expect to have Goldstone bosons that are scalars, but with fermionic statistics. Um, and, you know, at least as far as we can tell, up to one loop, this is true. The reason I find this surprising, right, it's the thing you would have said is obviously like the generalization of Goldstone's theorem. The reason I find it surprising, right, is we know that Goldstone's theorem fails in gauge theories. And one way you would say that Goldstone's theorem fails in gauge theories is because you have negative number states. That's a violation of one of the generic uh, requirements of Goldstone's theorem. So here, you are also violating that requirement of Goldstone's theorem, but nonetheless, at least in perturbation theory, at one loop, Goldstone's theorem appears to hold, uh, the Goldstones are the fermionic scalars. And they get eaten, if you gauge the theory, they get eaten to become the longitudinal nodes of the bosonic vector, excuse me, the fermionic vectors. Um, to just mention a little more detail, and I want to tell you a few more things before wrapping up. So again, the, the structure of the VEV, you have components uh, in the n by n block and the n by m block. You get mass for the gauge bosons, the fermionic vectors, and live up here and up here. Um, you would imagine if you took the VEV to infinity, what would happen is you would completely decouple these states. Right? These states would go to infinity. 
you would still have these negative sign degrees of freedom, but at least in the Yang Mills theory, the interactions between the positive sign and the negative sign ve bosonic vectors are through the intermediate states, and so somehow you're decoupling these two sectors. Okay. But uh, unsurprisingly, you know, once you've Higgs the theory, there's masses for these wrong statistics vectors, and you can compute the corrections to the scalar mass, uh, and you find that they're proportional to the mass of the gauge bosons. So you, know, you, you, you can Higgs the theory, and you can make some of the vectors heavy, these fermented vectors heavy, but of course, uh, the scalar begins to feel that uh, breaking. This also begins to explain a little bit the surprising result that you can turn on soft masses for the fermionic vectors without having a unitarity problem. So if, uh, in some sense, you can think of it as being from some secret uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So, the obvious question is, can we, can we do like uh, Grinstein and Wise and O'Connell did for the Wick theory and ask, can we write down a theory of the Higgs mass uh, that's based on these groups? And of course, the first thing you might say is, well, probably you can. These theories can do very nice and finite. But isn't it just a weird version of Susan? Haven't I taken all of the nice, unitary, positive sign states of supersymmetry and replaced them with spin statistics violating versions? And isn't that just a bad? <laughs> a bad compromise to make. But there's some things about the theory with the supergroup internal symmetry that are very importantly different from the theory of space-time supersymmetry. That if you thought about it, you know, they, they can make a theory that up to the unitarity problems or questions is much more consistent with what we know from the LHC. So one observation is that, you know, if you have space-time supersymmetry, you have space-time supersymmetry. Right? Everything fits into a supermultiplet. Um, if you want to use supergroup internal symmetries to control the structure of radiative corrections, you don't have to put the entire standard model into a supergroup. It's a bit like saying in composite models, you know, the Higgs, the, the global symmetry that controls the Higgs mass, QCD can be a bystander to that. Um, so you could imagine certain parts of the standard model could be embedded into supergroups, uh, and there could be also parts that have ordinary bosonic symmetries. You could also imagine, once you turn on gauge bosons, only gauging well-behaved bosonic subgroups. So you have much more freedom, right, if you want to use supergroups to control radiative corrections in an extension of the standard model. You have much, much more freedom than, than space-time supersymmetry. The other thing I want to point out is even if you said, I want to try to solve the big hierarchy problem, so I want to put the entire standard model into a theory with these supergroup and tone symmetries, you're also freed from some of the very practical things that make space-time supersymmetry in conflict with LHC data. So for example, one of the things that's awkward about space-time supersymmetry is the Higgs mass is 125 GeV. That's awkward because in space-time supersymmetry, the Higgs mass is controlled by the gauge couplings, and at tree level, it should be the mass of the Z. Okay, so to get yourself from the mass of the Z to 125 GeV requires rate of corrections that enter the physical Higgs mass only logarithmically, but increase the fine-tuning of the weak scale quadratically. So in some sense, the space-time supersymmetry is already in bad shape once we discover the Higgs at 125 GeV because we had a hard time actually making a successful prediction of the Higgs mass that wasn't fine too. If you're using an internal supergroup, there's no requirement that quartic that controls the Higgs mass is not related to the gauge coupling. Right? And so explaining Higgs at 125 GeV suddenly becomes a much simpler thing to do. So you know, this is not, if you took this all to its natural conclusion and you wrote down an extension of the standard model with supergroup internal symmetries, you're not just changing the properties of some of the particles that are predicted, but you actually have much more freedom uh, in how you use the symmetry to explain the Higgs mass than you did the space-time supersymmetry. So, you know, it's, I know there are ghosts, and those are bad, but there are many interesting and surprising properties of theory, so it might be worth thinking about a little bit more. Um, I want to just end with some brief comments uh, about work that's not mine, but if you were worried about understanding whether these theories exist non uh you might find this other work to be somewhat interesting. And the reason why it's useful to think about whether these theories exist non perturbatively is, you know, it's often the case, I, this is not the first time I've thought about um, non-compact internal symmetries in my life, but this is the first time I'm thinking about writing a paper on one. What you find in all of the instances is remarkable things happen in perturbation theory, but sometimes that's because you're secretly dividing by zero, right? So if you're dividing by zero, anything can happen. So you'd like to know that these theories exist non perturbatively before you get carried away by the surprises that we learned in perturbation theory. There was actually a really interesting paper uh, by some relatively famous people um, asking about how supergroups arise in the context of string theory. 
Um, and they pointed out that the SUNM theories, the gauge theories, are actually the low energy limit of some peculiar string constructions. So we're used to, of course, ordinary SUN theories arising at the low energy limit of strings that are stretching between a stack of D brains, of N D brains. Um, what they observed is actually these theories I just talk, talked about, the gauge theories uh, with internal supergroups, they actually result as the low energy limit of strings that connect a uh, stack of N ordinary D brains with M negative or ghost D brains. Now these are not anti brains, which some of us have some experience with. These are, these are uh, brains that have both negative charge and negative tension. Okay, so they are, of course, for the gravitationally inclined among you, they should set off the alarm, alarm bells. Uh, they are negative tension objects in your string theory. Uh, but anyway, if you hold your, your nose at that, uh, these gauge theories arise as low energy limit of these string configurations. But um, just in terms of being able to end strings, there's no problem. Yep. That's, what's That's right. Perturbatively, they, exactly. they look okay. Exactly. That's right. Okay, but of course they're negative tension objects. So unsurprisingly, uh, if you study the these theories as gravitating theories, you create a naked singularity. Uh, what happens is that uh, if you make a stack of a large number of these negative brains, you end up with some naked singularity that surrounds them. And if you probe this with positive tension probe brains, what you find is you can have an ordinary space time. It looks like you can actually extend these objects across this apparent singularity, but what happens across the surface is there's actually a, a sign flip in the space-time metric. So you go from having whatever nine spatial dimensions in one time dimension to eight spatial dimensions in two time dimensions, or ten spatial dimensions in zero time dimensions inside this region that's across. So uh, I don't know if that makes you encouraged that these theories exist or discouraged that they exist. Um, but uh, you can at least try to study what happens to these uh, negative tension objects themselves. There was something else they were able to do with this observation that you could construct these theories as low energy limits of a string theory that actually does, should give you more courage that these theories might exist on the Um So they studied theories that had both uh, more than minimal space-time supersymmetry, so n equals to space-time supersymmetry, and uh, a non-compact, this, uh, this uh, graded the algebra internal symmetry is the gauge theory. Okay? So we know, of course, if you have an ordinary SUN gauge theory with this space-time supersymmetry, these theories are soluble. Uh, in particular, you can construct something called the Sadler witten curve that allows you to basically compute the full infrared properties of the theory. And uh, what they, one of the things they did in this very nice paper was point out, well, once they have a string construction, there's some geometric engineering tricks you can use to compute the Sadler witten curves for these theories, so they could actually extend the calculation to these uh, graded Lie algebras. And what they found, uh, it's not worth going into details, but they found there's basically a construction that allows them to calculate it. The result they get for the cyber witten curve agrees with the naive result you would have gotten by taking an ordinary cyber witten curve and changing traces to these super traces. Okay, so that's your naive guess. It turns out to agree with the string construction. And then they talked to Nekrasov, and Nekrasov gave them a trick for actually doing the instant time calculation which is the other way that you might try to compute the side of the witten curve, and that also turns out to agree. So it appears that in some sense there is a well-defined meaningful side of the witten curve for these very supersymmetric theories, um, and the fact that that exists, right, this is computing non-perturbative contributions, the fact that this exists and be, can be computed in lots of different ways might give you encouragement that at least very symmetric versions of these theories actually exist in the perturbation theory. Okay. Uh, so that brings me to my conclusions. Um, you know, to me, we're in this interesting period where the mysteries of the standard model are great, and our confusion is even greater, uh, and so we should leave no stone unturned in the search for answers to these problems. In particular, trying to explain the Higgs mass, we should be trying with everything we have at our disposal to do that. Um, of course, I realize we shouldn't try too hard, right? So there, there's a limit to, you know, what, what crazy theories you, can, you should think about. Um, so there are some stones that have scorpions under them. We should leave those, those stones alone. Um, I think historically, you know, no one really had really thought about internal supersymmetry because it's clear as soon as you start to think about it that you have negative one states. So that's apparently a bunch of scorpions under a stone, and that's why no one's turned it over. Okay? Um, but hopefully, as I've convinced you of today, you know, one thing worth keeping in mind is the negative one states, they're not any worse, even though they're wrong spin statistic states, they're not any worse than the sort of wrong sign states that people have already grappled with in the context of the weak theories. Um, and so in that sense, it's not really in any worse of a situation. 
it's a bit better, in fact, because you know there is some uh, evidence, in particular coming from this Dijkraaf and Vafa paper, that these theories might be on even better footing. There might be a notion of non-perturbative definition of them. Um, but then, if you if you just you know you put on your anti-scorpion boots and you get a long stick and you flip over the stone, okay, you find these theories are very interesting. Right? They have sort of remarkable finiteness properties um, that that, to my knowledge, no one had noticed before, um, and you know. Although they are making the theory finite with negative normal states, unlike Lewick theory, they're doing it in a very principled way. They're doing it with symmetry. And so the fact that the quadratic divergences cancel the hard cutoff is physically meaningful because the states should, in fact, all have the same cutoff. Okay. Um, you know, they, if you push this a little further, they're not just nicely finite theories, but the finiteness persists even if you deform the theory in, in phenomenologically relevant ways. So soft breaking works. Uh, like it does in space-time supersymmetry, and that means it's plausible to end up with a theory where the low energy degrees of freedom are normal, and these exotic degrees of freedom uh, exist at, at higher energy. Um, and then, you know, as I've commented at least at the end, if you ask, okay, what if we tried to write down a, a version of the standard model where these symmetries feature and we can predict the Higgs mass, it's not just a weird version of space-time supersymmetry. The ways in which these symmetries can appear and the consequences of them for the predictions of parameters in the standard model um, are much more flexible. And so, you know, in some sense, if we can convince ourselves that unitarity and interacting theory uh, is something we can believe in, then uh, the way that this would allow you to predict the Higgs mass, it would tell you that there are some interesting states that could naturally lie consistent with current bounds of the LHC, but nonetheless satisfactorily explain the, the mass of the Higgs that we see. Thanks for giving me. Questions? Uh, yeah, so we know in regular SUSI we require equal amount of fermionic state and bosonic state. And so in this case, do you require the same amount of bosonic state with round states and the same amount? It, it depends on what, so what's, what's peculiar is the, the when we say this S U N bar M and the M is telling you about the number of, of uh, anti commuting <coughs> generators versus the commuting generators, it's not quite even that, it's not really counting the dimensions, but these are the quantities that sort of label the relative amounts of. Uh, commuting and anti-commuting parts of the algebra. What's interesting is that for one choice of m is equal to n plus 1, for many different representations where the relative numbers of right and wrong statistics fields are changing, the cancellations all persist. So for example, in the scalar example where it's in the fundamental, you need one more wrong statistics field than your right statistics field for the quartic to be well behaved. But when you have this Yukawa interaction where you have fields in the adjoint and the fundamental, now there is much, much, you know, there's new. So yeah, it is, it is, there, there is a, there's a, there's probably a deeper and simpler, we, we discovered these numbers empirically. We calculated, or Emmanuel in his infinite power, calculated a bunch of loop diagrams, okay, and discovered that this was the choice for which everything seemed to be fine. Right? There presumably is a deeper way of understanding that, but I don't know what it is yet. Um, it's not really my field, so I'm, I'm still a little confused what you mean by internal symmetry. In the same way that if we say something has, you know, when we say the, the Higgs is a doublet of SU2, right? So you, SU2 is a local internal symmetry. We do a symmetry transformation. It, it mixes in the internal space of the fields. It doesn't do anything to the space-time uh, state, right? And, or if I have, you know, it, it, all I mean is it's an internal symmetry. Like we say, like the gauge group of the standard model is an internal symmetry, or isospin is an internal symmetry. All of these things are things that act on the internal states of the quantum mechanics and not on some uh, external space-time supersymmetry. In contrast with space-time supersymmetry, right? Space-time supersymmetry, it's, you know, and, and you see that in lots of ways. So space-time supersymmetry is, is actually, you know, uh, an extension of the space-time algebra, right? And it relates things that have different spins, for example. So that's really telling you that space-time is it, it's not distant interval. So yeah, what I really mean is, like the, the things that we, we call, you know, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 is an internal symmetry, uh, custodial symmetry of the Higgs is an internal symmetry. I mean, treating supersymmetry as that kind of symmetry, and not as something that relates to Parker. Uh, Marcus is slightly faster than John. Is there, um, do you, 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 maybe you just don't know, but is there a uh, positive norm Hilbert space version of these, with, presumably with negative energy states? Yeah, I think I think you can absolutely write down the theory with negative energy states. Now, then the, the you know, uh, I, I guess I don't know how you get past. So good. 
So yeah, since I have some um, ghost condensation experts in the audience, I guess in those theories, so certainly with the setting aside the spin statistics problem, if I were just thinking about the wrong sign degrees of freedom, then you would say, yeah, let me simply take those as wrong sign ghosts, as negative energy states, and the question is, is there a consistent infrared theory uh, in that background, I guess, right? And I don't know, you, you, you guys are the experts, would you tell me that there's a consistent ghost condensation story? Because in ghost condensation, if I understand correctly, you're taking seriously the positive metric negative energy version of the theory, right? I mean, I, I just think in that case, at least I think you know what problem you have. I mean, the, the thing is, it, it, it probably doesn't describe the real world, but it's a theory that is self-consistent. And you don't have to write the it, 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 you know, yeah. describes some sort of weird metastable state at best. Yeah. Right, but but at least you know you, yeah. you know what the rules yeah. are because yeah. it's just quantum yeah. mechanics. And you don't have to bend but, you know, Here I don't know yeah. what the rules no, are. Right. I stop right. paying. I always stop paying attention in Leewick when they start telling me. And, and you and you you get. I mean you, you get. I, you see why my agreement with you problem. because of how I skipped. I, yeah. I don't find the Leewick prescription convincing. I guess a question for you in the ghost condensate story. So again, as far as I know, the ghost condensate story you purely pursued sort of wrong sign bosonic to prove the story. What if you got your ghosts from spin statistics violation? So is that something? Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. Like, in fact, in a, something that I have on my list of homework problems is that I think, you know, like I said, you can there when you have uh, uh, when you have Grossman variables, there are actually two sort of natural choices of choosing the Hilbert space and the one there's one with positive norm states and one with indefinite metric states. We, when we quantize physical fermions, we use the positive mm -hmm. norm states, obviously. Mm -hmm. When we quantize ghosts, we use the negative norm mm -hmm. state. Uh, something I'd like to understand is if I took the ghost theory and quantized it with positive mm -hmm. norm exactly. states, yeah. what would I have? Right. Right. Okay, so I, would not, I don't know. I, something, it can't, I can't have BRSD. Some, yeah. but I have something, and I right. it'd be nice That's to right. understand what that theory is. And, and this is, in this, so this is what I wanted, because yeah, again, as far as I know, the ghost condensate literature, everyone just takes the wrong sign convention where it's clear where the energy issue goes. The problem with taking the positive metric quantization of the wrong statistics fields is that, you know, at least as I told you, you do see you get negative energy states, but of course, you know, where those live is not a manifestly covariant statement, right? Like, I, I quantize in some particular frame and found the antiparticles where my negative energy states, right? But there has to be some notion of a covariant version of the story where it's it, the, the statement about who is positive energy and who is negative energy is is covariant, right? Or so, something, something, you know. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so I, 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 this is a, I would love to know the answer to that. I have not found any literature that discusses this possibility. Generally, people seem to avoid pursuing ghosts as a result of spin statistics violation. Uh, in the same way that they pursued ghosts with wrong side states. So, yeah, I would love to know whether you can make sense of the ghost compensate for the spin statistics average. Um, the thing about n plus 1 in that diagram, mm -hmm. that is from a specific choice of the quartic interaction, phi star phi squared. Mm -hmm. you, you could choose some different. Uh, oh, but yeah, it has to be, at the level of those fields, it has to be, uh, so you, have, you can construct invariance out of super traces. So for that particular example, that's all you get. Uh, it's not like you, there's a single trace thing that if you wrote it down, uh, would give you some extra contribution. So no, if, it, if I wrote phi star ta phi squared. Yeah, so you, you just need to, you, I think the, what you want to construct that would have a different set of contractions is not invariant under the sun bar m internal symmetry transformations. Um, so in other words, it's, it's you know, the, the you, you, you use super traces to make invariants and not normal traces to make invariants. And at the end of the day, if you get a non-vanishing variant. There's, there's a unique one. For, for this case, if you have more degree, more scalars, it may be, yeah, it may be that I can write down multiple uh, structures, multiple trace structures, where one of them doesn't do the same cancellation. That's, I can't think of that. How about phenomenology? How would you phenomenology. look for it? Well, I mean, so so you know, there's this again, I think probably a disreputable story for Lewick theories that um, although the theories are local in the indefinite metric quantization, they have 
uh, some microscopic a causality, right? This idea that you, if you imagine firing a beam of particles at a target, it would then induce some showers, that in Lee-Wick theories, if you fired a beam of Lee-Wick particles, right, the showers would actually appear before the target by a very small amount. Okay, that's, this is this microscopic a causality story. That we so if that's how you talk to yourself into unitarity of the interacting theory in this case, presumably the same thing would happen. I don't, in my heart of hearts, believe that if, the, if there's a unitary interacting version of the story, I don't actually believe that it's going to be the Lee-Wick contortion, and so I don't know if this microscopic a causality is actually an intrinsic ingredient. Um, okay, so whether you get this funny a causality in the vertices, I don't know. Of course, you could ask the interesting questions, I and mean, this is, you know, I talked to Roni at Fermilab, uh, and Roni wanted to know immediately, he's like, how do we know that the top quark is a right statistics Fermilab? <laughs> and so, yeah, you, you, you would presumably, you know, the, the angular distributions of wrong statistics fields but would presumably contain information that tells you that they violate some statistics. Uh, so that's, if you wanted to answer that. So I presume, we, I presume there's enough information that tells us that the top work respects some statistics, um, rather than just being an assumption that we've interpolated from light interviews of freedom. But I think if you discovered near degree of freedom, the question I would want to ask is what are the angular distributions of its parameters. Thanks very much for hearing me. <laughs>